Thank you very much for introducing me and for inviting me for this, for this conference and uh, for the speech to begin. I'm going to talk about intelligence and uh, an attempt to explain intelligence in terms of cognitive and uh, neural mechanisms. So first, I will talk about intelligence as a concept, as a notion. Then I will step to the question of significance of intelligence. Does it count in everyday life? Uh, next, I will talk about cognitive mechanisms of intelligence and attempts to boost it, to, to, to develop it through uh, cognitive trainings. Finally, I will address the question of neural and brain mechanisms of intelligence. The concept of intelligence is difficult to define, although we know what does it mean to be an intelligent person. It means that one is able to, uh, to think and reason, especially in very difficult cognitive tasks. It also means that one is able to solve problems, uh, to use language, uh, to learn, especially learn efficiently and uh, uh, speedily. So, for the psychology, from the psychological point of view, intelligence is an individual capacity, an individual trait to deal with such tasks. And we have IQ as an empirical measure of intelligence. Uh, I, uh, I'm talking about human intelligence, but we know that intelligence is not uh, also a human trait. It is also possible to investigate intelligence across species, other species, uh, across animals. Uh, for instance, we have uh, now a, 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 a possibility, methodological tools to investigate intelligence in uh, animals using very special tests like a test requiring uh, inhibition of learned uh, habit or the use of new knowledge. Uh, in general, these tests are uh, very distinct, I mean, revealing, because uh, using these uh, tasks, we can, we can uh, try to explain intelligence, not only in humans, but also in animals. It appeared, for instance, that animals who, which uh, are able to do two cognitive tasks. Uh, one, is, uh, mm, uh, one, one of them requires overcoming the habit, and another one uh, re requires uh, the mm, uh, use of uh, uh, knowledge in new, t new situation. It appeared that uh, uh, success in such tasks is predicted by, first of all, by brain volume, which is not, uh, which is not um, Mm, strange to explain, I think. And another factor explaining intelligence is the bre breadth of diet, diet breadth, meaning that animals who or which have uh, uh, the, I mean, they eat everything, <laughs> such animals are more intelligent than others. Maybe because f looking for, for, for food which is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, for the different kinds of food requires, uh, requires special cognitive tasks. Going back to human intelligence, we know that it's distributed across, uh, across people, and this distribution is usually uh, described with the um, normal distribution curve. We uh, uh, usually define the uh, average, the average uh, result in cognitive tasks as uh, IQ equal 100, and the distribution, which is shown here, the statistical distribution defines um, which is the, what is the individual level of in intelligence. Is it below or uh, above this uh, average? To measure this uh, uh, ability, we usually use the specialized tests. Um, it's not like in animals. It, uh, tests for humans must be much more difficult and demanding. Usually there are uh, tests of uh, analogy. Like here, you can see the abstract analogy test. A to B is like C is to something, which is not, not known. Not known now, uh, 
yet, and the, the, the task is to find the fourth element, uh, which is uh, suitable for this analogy. Uh, usually, the task is to, uh, to choose one of these four uh, alternatives, options. And the uh, human individual ability to solve such tasks is usually regarded to be the estimation of one's intelligence. Uh, it appears that uh, such a simple approach, such a simple uh, and uh, uh, unitary measure of intelligence is predict, uh, has, uh, I mean, it, it, it may predict various uh, important things. Most of all, academic achievements, of course, but you can see, this is the study by Linda Gottfredson, you can see that uh, IQ predicts uh, job success, not only in uh, difficult uh, domains, demanding uh, professions, but also in uh, other professions. Mm, it also predicts uh, income, it predicts criminal rate, and uh, uh, years of education, of course. Strength of such correlation is different, but even if the uh, f f regular jobs, jobs which are not demanding, uh, very difficult, uh, still we can see some predictive value of IQ. Uh, we know that some professions like attorney or engineer uh, require much more intelligence than other professions, but also in the unskilled professions, the predictive value of IQ is uh, positive. So it's, uh, it's better to be an intelligent person that, than a uh, less intelligent one. Uh, it appears that uh, IQ counts also in, in, uh, in a very special task, which is just life. Uh, in the, one of the first studies of this kind, uh, the Australian study, uh, they sh the authors showed that uh, mortality is predicted by IQ. They took uh, conscripts, people who entered army at the age of 18, and then <clears throat> they investigated them uh, 20 years later. And they found that uh, conscripts which were above the average in, on the IQ scale uh, had uh, much less mortality rate than conscripts which were below the, uh, the uh, average. So uh, one point on at the IQ scale, it appears that one point at the IQ scale uh, predicts one percent of risk of death. The author commend this study as the ultimate validity of IQ test. Indeed, if they predict uh, life and death, uh, they must be valid. They must be uh, useful. Another approach of this kind comes from, I mean, it's, uh, this is the study uh, made, done in Scotland by Ian Deer and his collaborators. In Scotland, in, uh, it happened that in 1932, all Scottish children at the age of 11 were tested for intelligence. All, all the population. So it's not the sample, but the population which, were, which was uh, investigated. During the last two decades of the 20th century, it was possible to trace some of them when they were at the age of 16 or, uh, 60 or, or 80. Uh, and sometimes the percentage of, of uh, this sample, I mean, this, this uh, people who uh, were impossible to investigate later on was quite high. And it appeared that uh, uh, the mortality rate also depended on uh, intelligence. If we, divide it, if we divide the sample into four quartiles statistically, we can see that the, the, uh, the lowest quartile, the lowest quartile is the represents the, the people who are more susceptible to, uh, to, to, to risk, which are mm, uh, more probably, more likely to, to die before uh, the normal uh, statistical age of death. Uh, this is the uh, uh, graph showing, representing men. In women, it's even more visible. The, the lowest quartile uh, consists of 
people who are more susceptible, more vulnerable to, to be dead. So intelligence predicts life success, but intelligence also predicts life as such. And for that reason, it's very important to know what intelligence really is. What are the cognitive and neural um, substrates or mechanisms of this trait? Uh, going to the cognitive substrates, uh, I, could, I could talk about three. I can talk about three uh, possible candidates. First, attention. The uh, uh, capacity of attention or um, the ability of uh, of one of a person to concentrate attention to control attention is regarded to be a, a predictor of intelligence in other words we can probably explain intelligence as a concept uh, with the use of uh, attention attention as a concept of the lower uh, of the lower uh, stage or lower um, more uh, which is a concept more elementary in nature than uh, intelligence. In other words, we don't know exactly what intelligence is, but uh, studying attention, we can explain uh, this concept with the, the, with the knowledge of uh, attention performance. Uh, the second candidate is working memory capacity, especially the storage capacity how many elements we can store in our working memory. Uh, this number of elements is, uh, by the way, very small. For instance, it's estimated that uh, people can retain a, about four elements at the most in their working memory. Uh, four elements, maybe three, mm, uh, it's not a big number. Still, people differ in this ability to maintain elements in working memory, so the these individual differences are sometimes accounted for by this uh, storage capacity. Another candidate is the relational integration, a very specific mechanism in working memory which, uh, uh, which amounts to the ability to uh, temporarily bind elements. For instance, we can, uh, in reasoning, we can bind premises uh, for a fraction of a second in order to, to, to catch the temporary conclusion. And then another, uh, set of con another set of premises is important, is valid, so we have to combine them for a fraction of a second, and so on and so on. And this ability to uh, integrate elements in working memory appears to be very uh, predictive of the general level of human intelligence. And the third candidate is cognitive control which is the human ability to, uh, to exert control over, uh, over our um, cognitive functions. It is usually measured through tasks such as interference resolution or prepotent response inhibition. For instance, we ask people not to respond to what is uh, a very strong stimulus to respond. So people who can stop who can uh, uh, withhold this uh, impulsive, sometimes very impulsive, a very strong, uh, uh, very strong inclination to respond? This such people appear to be more um, uh, more uh, able in IQ tests. There are two ways to investigate cognitive substrates, substrates of intelligence. The first one is the correlational approach which is much more popular and uh, there are plenty of uh, data suggesting that uh, IQ test results are correlated with, uh, for instance, attention performance or working memory capacity or cognitive control indices. Uh, these are both correlations and the so-called structural equation models. Uh, which are able to show uh, complicated, complex uh, relations between variables like uh, cognition and intelligence. Another approach is an experimental one, and this approach is much more promising, I think, because uh, uh, 
in order to ask the question, what is the cognitive explanation of intelligence, we train people in some cognitive tasks, and we check whether such trainings are uh, uh, successful. And the rationale is that if uh, we train, for instance, if we train working memory, and such a training results in increasing of IQ, one's intelligence quotient, it means that working memory itself is the cognitive basis of intelligence. Otherwise, if, if, if the training is not successful, we, we can conclude that what we had trained is not the, does not relay, does not uh, refer to, to intelligence. And uh, now I'm going to, uh, to show you some uh, experiments on this cognitive training because uh, this is something we have, uh, we have done in, in my team, uh, and uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, relevant to the question of what intelligence is. Before that, I can show you the structural equation modeling approach to intelligence. This is the study made by uh, Hudersky and his colleagues. Uh, we can see a number of cognitive tasks. These are usually the computerized tasks of uh, well, uh, working memory, attention, cognitive control, and so on. We can see three latent variables, which is uh, relational integration, this working memory capacity to integrate, to bind information for a short time. We have uh, primary memory, which is the, just the storage capacity of working memory, and its ability to update information, to, to write and, and uh, to, to, to write down the information and to remove it quickly. And the third uh, latent variable is uh, just fluid intelligence. The, the intelligence as such, the, the most uh, uh, primitive, the most elementary uh, aspect of intelligence. We can see that these uh, latent variables are connected quite strongly, especially this connection between uh, uh, relational integration and fluid intelligence. It's interesting because it suggests, it suggests that about three-thirds of IQ variation is explained by this specific, this specific process of working memory um, relational integration. But this is the uh, correlational approach, in fact. We know that correlation is not causation. It means that sometimes it's possible to explain working memory capacity by intelligence rather than the opposite. And the question, I mean, it's a question of choice whether we uh, take this model or another one. And there are no mm, uh, reasons, no ways to, uh, to mm, decide for sure. Therefore, the training approach uh, seems much more promising from this point of view. And now, <coughs> two uh, approaches, two, two studies uh, which, uh, in which we uh, train people in cognitive tasks. In the first study, we investigated uh, children, school children, uh, w which were divided into the experimental group and the control group. The experimental group trained uh, attention, whereas the control group trained uh, just psychomotor tasks, simple tasks like similar to the computer games which were not uh, connected with attention uh, directly, although we know that attention is necessary for every cognitive task. Anyway, we uh, deliberately trained the uh, cognitive uh, aspects of attention, and we had uh, two criterion tasks, the intelligence test, Raven's progressive matrices, and uh, D2 attention test. The training tasks were uh, especially designed for for children. Uh, these were just the computer games uh, in which they, they train selective attention, vigilance, and the ability to pay attention for the long time. Uh, they trained anti psychotic tasks, uh, a task which required, which required to, to, uh, uh, to direct eyes uh, in the opposite direction, opposite to the prepotent, uh, prepotent uh, stimulus and they train task switching, switching attention between two tasks, so so-called multitasking. For instance, a, a child who was shown a, a picture uh, with fishes and the, the 
the instruction was, you are a hungry fish swimming in the pool. You can eat small red fishes swimming around. Avoid poisonous yellow fishes. And this is a very special, very specific task for selective attention. And the, we manipulated with number of fishes, number of fishes to avoid, and so on and so on. And these trainings were quite uh, long uh, because it, uh, one session lasted for one, one hour and they trained for uh, two weeks. The control group uh, also had computerized tasks. There was spatial orientation and so, uh, simple psychomotor skills. Uh, we, of course, pre-tested them. I mean, applied, we applied the Raven's matrices, the intelligence test and attention test before the training and after the training and finally three months after the training lasted. I mean, it was the uh, prolonged or um, second post-test. In this way, we wanted to check whether the possible outcomes of the training will be durable or not. And you can see that uh, uh, you can see the control group in yellow and the experimental group in blue. We can see that the attention indices improved through training. However, they disappeared after three months. In the second uh, measure of attention, it also you can see the improvement uh, after the training and disappearance of these effects after three months. As to intelligence, you cannot see any effect whatsoever, meaning that uh, the differences between uh, pre-test and post-test are not uh, significant, and uh, especially between the pre-test and the delayed post-test, these differences are also insignificant. So we conclude that mm, IQ gains are very small, sometimes maybe uh, not existent, uh, concerning the first post-test, and definitely no improvement in the second post-test. Although the attention, must, uh, the, the, the attention scores improved significantly, uh, at least in the first post-test. The, the durability of this effect is questionable too. In the second study, we used working memory tests, working memory tasks, sorry. So instead of attention, we trained working memory in the same or very similar design. We also investigated uh, school children. We had Raven's matrices and another test of intelligence, Wexler for children. And the third, the third uh, measure was the working memory capacity uh, test. Uh, children trained uh, tasks such as keep track or end back. These are the standard methods to investigate uh, working memory. In this uh, study, we did not use them as a test, as tests, but as, a, as uh, training procedures. Uh, again, in the computer, uh, computerized game-like manner, we investigated the ability to train these aspects of working memory. For instance, a child was told that um, a child was presented with the instruction like that. You are responsible for feeding animals in the zoo. You have to remember which animal already got food and has to wait until the next round. In this way, we uh, were able to, to train their ability to update working memory and to keep only valid information and to forget which is invalid. Uh, the procedure was also similar to the first study. There were pre-test sessions, intervention phase, phase uh, no, sorry, not attention training, but working memory training, of course. It's my, my mistake. And the uh, first and second post-test. Um, as to Raven's matrices, the uh, results concerning intelligence test, you can see some effects of training in the, there are differences between pre-test and post-test, but these differences were significant, statistically significant all, only in the experimental group, meaning that uh, training uh, improved children's working memory to some extent. Uh, concerning WISC, Wexler intelligence test, 
uh, these uh, effects were much more visible, much stronger. You can see no differences between the groups uh, in the pretest, although there are some differences, but they are not statistically significant. We can see improvement in both groups, although the improvement in the experimental group is much uh, stronger. As to OSPAN measure, the measure, uh, the, the complex measure to investigate working memory capacity, we can see a huge improvement in the experimental group and some decrease in the control group. We, we, we frankly speaking, we don't know why the control group lost the, some ability after training. But this training in the control group was not the training of working memory, of course. Uh, these are the details concerning Wexler intelligence tests for children, uh, which uh, subtests appeared significant, which subtests showed increase in, in intelligence. Uh, not every uh, subscale appeared significant. Uh, usually, some called, so called uh, verbal uh, scale uh, appeared much more significant, much more important from this point of view than the non-verbal scale, uh, and uh, if you are interested what, what are the possible explanations of these results, uh, it may be an interesting topic for discussion, but not now maybe. Uh, the conclusion of the second study are, are like, like this. Working memory improved with training, which is measured mostly with this OSPAN measure. Intelligence improved too. Although WISC uh, results uh, behave better than Raven's results, when we talk about the criterion measure of intelligence. So, what did the training approach suggest? It suggests that training working memory improves intelligence, but training attention does not. Maybe the conclusion should be like that, that working memory, rather than attention, is a cognitive substrate of G. In other words, if we are, we are looking for explanation, if we try to explain intelligence in terms of, of cognition, we uh, probably should address working memory processes rather than other aspects of cognition. Specific aspects of intelligence can be improved rather than just IQ, meaning that intelligence is probably not a unitary concept. Uh, it's probably, uh, it probably consists of several separated, although connected, uh, skills or processes. In other words, we should expect the general increase uh, as a result of training, which is not the case. And durability of transfer effects are questionable, meaning that probably we, you can, we can improve our intelligence through training, but if we uh, get rid of training, these effects disappear. It's probably very similar to training other skills, like uh, uh, training uh, muscles in the gym. Uh, as, as long as we train, our, our muscles are uh, better. But if we quit training, um, the effects disappear too. So we probably have the same effect concerning uh, intelligence or cognitive skills in general. Now, let me, uh, how much time do I have? Well, I think you have a few more minutes if you need them. A few more minutes, okay. So, uh, just a few words about where in the brain in this intelligence. Because we have, uh, I, I, I talk about the cognition, and uh, one uh, layer below, we have the neural substrates of such uh, mechanisms, like, such as evoking memory or attention. Well, according to the, to the contemporary knowledge, uh, the answer to this question is quite simple, nowhere, nowhere. Uh, meaning that there is no single uh, place or locus uh, in which intelligence is located in the brain. Rather, we can, we can talk about um, dispersed mechanisms. So intelligence is nowhere, like in this cartoon. But uh, going to the contemporary knowledge of the brain mechanisms of intelligence, we can see that we can, we can talk about things like that. First of all, 
we know that intelligent brains are just bigger. There is a small but significant effect of brain size, of course, compared to the, to the, um, to the uh, uh, body weight, which is an important proportion, of course. Second, intelligent brains are just faster. They, the transmission, the neural transmission in, in the nervous system is, uh, is quicker in people who are brighter than in other people. Third, intelligent brains are more regular in their activity, usually across long series of tasks. Uh, for instance, if we investigate uh, the brain responses to events, the event-related potentials uh, in the EEG um, methodology, we can see uh, the regularity of responses in the case of intelligent people and lack of regularity in the case of less intelligent ones. Fourth, uh, intelligent brains are more efficient, meaning that they consume less resources while dealing with comparable tasks. In other words, intelligence results in uh, less or, or more uh, 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 efficient consumption of glucose and other resources, which means that uh, intelligent brain is able to deal with much more difficult tasks compared to, uh, to other, um, other um, cases. Uh, the next uh, neural correlate of intelligence is anatomical connectivity, meaning that intelligent brains are just better interconnected. Different uh, places, different loci in the brain are better connected in, in terms of uh, white matter integrity. It is now quite, quite, quite uh, well known that uh, intelligence is correlated with integrity of uh, tracts in the human brain especially uh, the integrity between the parietal and frontal um, lobes of the brain. And functional connectivity as the last correlate of intelligence, meaning that uh, uh, intelligent brain, brains respond in the correlated manner. If sometimes happens in one locus, uh, a corresponding process is responding in the same time, exactly in the same time, in the correlated manner in another place uh, of this complex uh, system. Going back to the, to the end of my talk, I, can, I would like to concentrate on what we know and what we not know, what we don't know concerning human intelligence. First of all, uh, we have to know what are the cognitive mechanisms of intelligence, mechanisms rather than correlates, because the vast amount of, of knowledge, of existing knowledge concerning the cognition and intelligence is the knowledge of correlates. And uh, this uh, training approach I, I, I was trying to show you is much less popular, but it's changing. Second, we need to know how intelligence in, is implemented in the brain. Again, uh, we need uh, to know what are the mechanisms rather than correlates of uh, intelligence. Third, we, know, we need to know uh, whether intelligence is malleable, is changeable. Is it possible to develop, to train, uh, is it developed to, uh, to improve, especially to improve uh, because of, uh, as, a, as a result of short-term intervention? Because we know that intelligence can develop in the lifelong perspective, but that's not the, the case here. And uh, finally, we, know, we need to know what are the cognitive and neural substrates of so-called so soft intelligences. The vast amount of knowledge, of existing knowledge, refers to general intelligence, fluid intelligence, mm, things like that, which is very important, of course, but it does not explain uh, social skills or emotional skills, which are also uh, important for our understanding of intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions, and given the size of the room, I suggest people use the mic or anyway speak as loudly as they read.
one very simple one to build with this aspect of it. Like, um, when we, I listen to, to your lecture, I just wonder if there is any place or role for phenomenal insights which we have when we intuit in action. So when we use our own intelligence, uh, when projecting or designing those experiments that you do. I mean, do we take this into account or we try to avoid the first person perspective in designing experiments? And the second question quite, quite well, the question is easy, but that's my difficult. Um, is it possible to call someone intelligent who is not able to quickly solve tasks? The person needs time, but, for example, if given a lot of time, uh, is able to solve much more complex, difficult tasks. Thank you. Well, for me, the, the second question is, I think, easier. <laughs> Because uh, we know that uh, uh, speed of uh, transmission and uh, mental speed are important um, predictors of intelligence, but it does not mean that intelligent person always, always responds quickly and is the first to, to respond and things like that. Uh, we are not talking about impulsivity, we are talking about intelligence, meaning that somebody can be very fast at the basic level of explanation, like the speed of neural transmission, uh, but this trait responds in longer reaction time in difficult situations. Usually we observe uh, some kind of reflectivity or, or the uh, inclination to, to withhold uh, response in, in the case of intelligent people, uh, although they are very fast at the basic level of, uh, of uh, uh, transmission. Therefore, the speed of transmission is usually measured with, a, with very simple tasks, tasks which are not, which are not uh, intelligent, or which, are, which do not require intelligence as such. And the first question, uh, as I understood you, it's the question of the first person perspective and the third person perspective. Am I right? Or? Can we say we know something about intelligence from our own first person, the person perspective, and that influences the way we design experiments? Well, the way we, we design experiments uh, depends on our sometimes implicit knowledge or implicit convictions about what intelligence is. Because there is no strict and... Uh, um, uh, and uh, and consensual uh, definition of intelligence. So every experiment is based on some, some kind of uh, implicit personal knowledge. What does it mean to be an intelligent person? Uh, however, uh, if we, if we uh, agree for such an approach, the approach that intelligence is not defined properly, maybe, or it's not defined strictly, uh, designing of experiment does not need, I think, the first person perspective. It's just, uh, it's just uh, normal science. <laughs> uh, so I, I would say that the very start, the starting point w maybe needs the first person perspective, so phenomenology of intelligence, things like that. But in practice, it does not. That would be my point. Would that mean, um, from your thesis, that um, the brain actually grows with the use of intelligence? And how that is? Because you, you said that there are, there are changes in, um, I would say, density of the white matter and, uh, and the size. So, how does the brain grow in the physical sense and get tightened through the use of intelligence? Well, uh this question is difficult for me because I'm a psychologist, not the neurologist and a neurobiologist. But as far as I know, well, brains uh, develop and grow faster and become bigger and, and bigger. Uh, but first of all, they, are, they, they become more organized uh, internally, they more complicated internally. Brain size is an is a significant predictor of intelligence, but this relation is quite, uh, quite uh, small. I mean, uh, it's not a strong connection. 
the co in the in terms of correlations, it's like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 at the at the most, meaning that brain science is one of many, uh, you know, bases of intelligence, and not the important, the most important one. And this, and the second uh, the second question, I mean. What we know about the brain size and intelligence refers to adults. I mean, if we take into account the growing, developing brains, uh, it, the picture is much more complicated and uh, methodolog methodologically it's much more difficult. And I don't know studies like that, comparing brain size in children and their uh, intelligence scores. But what's the If, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if I, if I catch you. I, the question is if the brain grows through the training. Well, that, that's what I think it says, because you said that it becomes bigger through the use of intelligence. So what is the mechanism that makes the brain grow bigger and more um, um, connected through the use of intelligence? I cannot answer this question. What we know now is that th there are relationships like that. <laughs> and uh, I think we need much more uh, studies to know why. Uh, we don't know. I don't know. And I think the field does not know this. I have something brief. I was much interested in integration as an element in intelligence. And I wonder about the connection between integration I would think there might be one, and that this is a good area for testing. So there is what a subject tends to infer from something, and I have in mind interesting things that follow. What a subject sees does not follow, and then thirdly, and most interesting, inference to the best explanation, where creativity comes in, which we assume is associated with intelligence. So some people infer plausible explanations given problem or data and others don't. So how does inference come into your studies if it does? Well, uh, relational integration is, is strongly connected with the interference, uh, with uh, inference and logical inference. So, uh, but it, 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 it has been demonstrated mostly in the case of inductive reasoning. I don't know how it is concerning other types of reasoning, but in inductive reasoning, especially the, these analogy tasks, the connection is very strong and significant. Concerning creativity, what we know now suggests that creativity and intelligence are not correlated strongly. Maybe they are separated aspects of our uh, brain and our mind. But that, uh, of course, creativity is us more, us maybe sometimes in some, some domains, maybe even more important than intelligence in some tasks. Uh, for instance, in science. Uh, in science, every person active in the scientific activity, in scientific research, is intelligent because there is a strong selection for the doctoral studies, for, for the for, for this profession. This profession consists of intelligent people. But creativity is much less popular and much less, uh, no, I mean, uh, not so frequently found in this domain. So, and it's, it's, it's sometimes even more important. In this situation when everybody is intelligent and also only some of us are creative, Creativity is much more in important as a predictor of success in, in, in science. That would be my point. Mm -hmm. There's one point that interested me uh, with your intervention uh, approach. Uh, I mean, there, are some, there is some work on substrates, on working memory, neural substrates. So would it be is there any work that connects like natural lesions in working memory and intelligence tests, or maybe one could apply transcranial magnetic stimulation to stop the stereos from working and see what are the intelligence? Then you could show strong results. As far as I know, 
the functional lesions approach was not successful concerning intelligence, meaning that it's, it's not possible to switch off intelligence. <laughs> uh, although it's possible to switch off other functions, like empathy, for instance, and, uh, which are probably more... more um, uh, intelligence is a broad concept and not unitary one. Maybe this is the case, this is the explanation. If intelligence was, uh, were uh, one thing, it would be possible to switch it off through transcranial stimulation. It appears not to be. I think there's time for perhaps one more question before we break. One back here. What do you mean, hidden co correlations? You mean, uh, yeah, but. Uh, I think we agree. Uh, were there any other variables controlled? Like there were controlled. Speculate that yeah. uh, officers uh, judging intelligence sent the less bright to do the more dangerous jobs, <laughs> as opposed to the brighter surviving dangers by cleverness more readily. I think that's the thrust of the question. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe less, um, less spectacular, spectacular examples, that's like just, a, just a, um, conditions of life or mm -hmm. something like that. What they, uh, they controlled uh, income, education, and uh, social and economic status, which is or almost the same like, as income. So uh, these uh, variables were uh, controlled statistically. So what we can see is the pure impact of intelligence. These variables are mm, correlated. We know that intelligent people are more likely to, uh, to get education, to get higher income, and so on and so on. So such uh, pictures are uh, telling, tell us something only if we control these things. Uh, but, of course, we cannot control more complex mechanisms like this. Um, so maybe intelligent people are survive uh, better or more frequently because of much more uh, complicated mechanisms we cannot control. I, I think, I know that they, don't, they didn't control things like that. Well, thank you for an interesting paper and discussion.